All right. <clears throat> can we start today? Uh, can, can we actually invite, uh, I'll invite us to stand today uh, and to rise for the reading of Scripture today. And we will be reading from Luke 19 today, a very familiar passage for some. Uh, so if please turn to that. If you don't have it in front of you, you have it on the screens to my left and to my right. But we'll read together and uh, as one church. Yes. So let's read. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good afternoon, PIF. It's a beautiful Sunday, but as I'm not a meteor meteorologist. I'm a pastor here. My name is Justin. If we haven't had the privilege to meet before, and if we haven't, I'd love for us to speak after service here. But uh, if you are if you haven't been in the, here in a while, or even if you missed last week, we're actually kind of like, we want we felt the, the burden of the Malachi sermon series, as great as it was. Uh, so we wanted to almost tone it down and have a little bit fun, uh, fun with the April sermon series here. And so uh, we kind of call this one Sunday School Redux, or just going over through a couple of verses that are really misinterpreted uh, just culturally, right? And this is important because I really feel like this, uh, with the culture that we're in these days, this is an important uh, th couple of things that we want to go over. But before I start today, uh, I actually want to share uh, or show a picture uh, on the screen here. This over here is titled over there, but it's a piece called New York City. And I'm not going to no one's going to confuse me for a modern art scholar or anything along the lines here, but just for some details here, this is a 1941-based picture of, by a man named Pierre Mondrian, and it used to hang in the MoMA, so that's kind of legit, but ever since 1980, it's been hanging in an art gallery in Dusseldorf, Germany, uh, for many to see. Now, this is a famous piece for those of us who have any kind of piece. Now, if you told me, if you just splattered this on a piece of paper, you could, you could have convinced me that you made this. So, like, I have no idea. I don't know how, uh, how important this is. But what's important for our purposes today is that in the year 2022, so just two years ago, it's still hanging in Germany. When they were preparing for an art show, the curator of that gallery uh, started to realize just by taking a long look at it and recognize something's off. After just doing some quick examinations and just thinking about like art theory, things I had no idea about, she recognized that this painting is upside down. So what you're seeing is how it's hung up, upside down. And you're thinking, how could these scholars be hanging this upside down for all of, for, for all of mankind, mankind to be confused by it? Well, a couple of things. One, if you're like me, you have no idea what's happening here. But this is representing the New York City skyline. So you're like, oh, I get it, right? Uh, those strips, and all the, the lattice structure, red, yellow, and blue, is meant to represent the skyscrapers. And initially, people thought that cluster on the bottom was meant to represent, I don't know, like the streets or something. But the curator started to recognize that, wait a second, that cluster is actually supposed to signify the night sky. And so it is indeed upside down. But what's worse is that since it didn't come with instructions because the artist had died soon after making this artwork, it didn't come with instructions, there's no signature, so no one would really know. But what's even worse is that they, rec they, re they realized that they can't put it right, back, right side up again. See, it's the adhesives are deterior deteriorating. And the, the pieces of tape are hanging by a thread. And so for the rest of mankind, for as long as we decide that this is an important piece of work, it will have to be upside down for all to see, upside down from how the artist had intended for it to be with no way to fix it. 
I think this is important for us here, not because I'm an art scholar, because I, I fell asleep in art appreciation class back in my high school days every single time. But more importantly, I think this is important for us because in the same way that for 75 years, curators, art appreciators, all these expensive, nice, cultured people were very convinced by looking at this like, you know, I really appreciate how the artists like, have like, such fine detail, and whatever. For 75 years, they were convinced that this artwork was inspiring, that there was detail and beauty to it, only to be told in hindsight starting in 2022 that it was upside down. And you're thinking like these lunatics, how could they think it? But in the same way, we as a church, we, I have to ask us this question. How convinced are we that the way that we worship, the way that we practice our faith, the way we read scripture, all of the things that we do in our faith is right? You know, we're facing this cultural moment. You might have heard that phrase before as, as a church these days. Some might call this era post-modernity. Some would call it post-Christendom. Many would, uh, would admit that we're in a very pluralistic society. The church used to go unchallenged in the way it taught. The, ch the Christianity used to go unchallenged as a, f as a principle of mankind. But nowadays, nothing can fly under the radar. I mean, you could thank social media for all these things, and I'm kind of grateful for it. But nowadays, you can't just, you know, just assume the way things used to be or how they've always been is the way it's supposed to be anymore. That's just the culture that these days, and we have to admit that. But I find that oftentimes we get a little behind the clock a little bit in the way we do church. And, and speaking to our sermon series today, so like Sunday School Redux, right? We have to examine and realize that the way we've been teaching the Bible for so long, for those of you who've grown up in church, you know what I'm talking about. The Bible has been taught as a series of moralistic lessons that we can kind of keep where, you know, we have like a flawed Bible character, but they have like this great American value, I mean biblical characteristic, where they can show us their, their triumphant like moral moralistic uh, uh, feature we praise god with it and then we could put it in our bible utility belt like we're batman or spider-man or something climb the scaffolding of like evil that is the world out there and then we, we go about our day and we read and we read today's passage about zacchaeus and i think zacchaeus is a perfect example of what's going on here because we use it as moral scaffolding to build up this idea that we just need to be like this guy in the Bible. We just need to be X and Y, and the rest of our world, uh, the rest of our lives will be fine. But I'll say this using this type of passage enables us to think like this. For the sake of translatability, we've deprioritized transformability. Amen. Anybody want to say that with me? We, for the sake of translatability, we've deprioritized transformability. Because what happens here, if we start reading Zacchaeus like it's a moral, like a moralistic triumphalism kind of piece, we start to disregard Luke the physician's consistent message throughout his gospel. Anybody know it? It's this. It's that Jesus is the Messiah that came to fulfill the Old Testament's word. And more importantly, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Amen? And that's the, f that's the real stuff here. If you read all throughout Luke, Luke, you'll see parable of the prodigal son, parable of the lost sheep, parable of the lost coin. We see that there's a priority on Jesus seeking and saving the lost. And, but more importantly for us, we know that. But the worst part is that we have taken for granted that the Lord's saving action is just a, for a very specific few. That if we make a, savor, a savoring prayer, a sinner's prayer, that we're fine. But I really believe that in the same way that for a long, a long, long time, that painting or that picture, New York City, was hung upside down with no one knowing. I really believe as a church that... For all of those who have thought that we're right side up all this time, can we take this time to examine, am I or have I been upside down this whole time? Because those who recognize that reality then are those who start to see that there's a need for salvation, that there's a need for saving, a savior. And so if we recognize that then, or if we're still struggling with that, may I invite us to use this piece today in the study of Zacchaeus, uh, him, the crowd around him, and the character of Jesus himself, so that we can remember this takeaway point for us today. And honestly, if you struggle with any of the Gospel of Luke, it's this point here, that Jesus came to an upside-down world to turn us back to right standing with God. Amen.
So let's start, let's start with this. Let's start actually today, but uh, let me backtrack a little bit. Let's actually start with some common misinterpretations of Zacchaeus. Now, who has a short person in their life? Any, anybody? Don't look. No eyes. Just think for a sec. Don't be rude. But we all know a short, a short person in our lives. If you're thinking of someone, that you're messed up. But we all know them. It's all right. It's cool. But here's the thing. What happens with Zacchaeus, there's a children's song that kind of goes like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. And we love to, if you ever think about Zacchaeus, you always remember the fact that he was a short guy. That's one of the things here. And so a lot of times, this gets preached as a, a message for the handicapped. Like, if you have a handicap of some sorts that, you know, you, you know, we applaud them for putting a little bit of extra effort. Like, this guy climbed a tree even though he can't see. Good for him. But the problem is context. If you read right before, this is Luke 19. In the end of chapter 18, we find another famous story where a blind beggar approaches Jesus. And, and, and when Jesus asks him, what can I do for you? He says, well, as you can see, I'm blind. Please, I would love to receive sight. And so in Luke 18, verse 42, Jesus says, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And immediately the, uh, the man received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. And so when all the people saw it, they also praised God. Amen. It's some good stuff. Now, you're thinking, other than the order of time events here, what do they have in common? Well, the man and Zacchaeus both could not see. They were impaired in sight. The blind man physically couldn't see. And, and Zacchaeus, as we see here, not that shortness is the problem, but he was shorter than the crowd, and so he had to go up. Then what else happened? They have in common the fact that they were both restored the ability to see, whether it's in physical sight or in the very fact that they were able to climb the sycamore tree to, uh, to see the vantage point. And lastly, they were both saved after seeing. They see that seeing is believing in this moment where the man, the, uh, the, man, the blind man was able to see and realize the Savior's in front of him. And when, for Zacchaeus' sake, he was in the tree, but he was called down from the tree because the Savior was in front of him. And what led to both of them understanding afterwards is that they were saved. They had a transformed life in Christ because of it. And again, the priority here is that Jesus came to the upside down world that we live in today and forevermore to turn us back right with the Father. That's why we're doing this. And so again, just the disclaimer number one, it's not about short people. It's not about handicapped people. This is about those who really understand that there's a seeing in the kingdom and a seeing in the flesh. Disclaimer number two, misinterpretation number two, this passage is not about money. Now, I think it's very appropriate that we schedule today's passage um, uh, to for the, uh, the Sunday on um, 4.14 because tomorrow is 4.15, which for everybody is tax day. And so I don't need to tell you that it's a little wicked for some agency to come and say you owe X amount of money or you're given X amount of money when we had to recalculate all these things. You know the feeling. If you ever watched that movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, you remember that Will Smith scene. He's like, that's my money. That's, that's my money. And we see how much of a struggle it is for somebody to be taking your money and for you to just live in a hole for a bit. In the same way, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, chief one at that. And he understood that like the other Jews saw him as a traitor because he was working for the Roman Empire, their oppressors, and taking their tax money and building his wealth off of it. So he knew, and everyone else knew, that he was at the very outskirts of society. He was the most upside down for many people in that place. For instance, a Pharisee once said in, uh, in Luke 18, this is, a, uh, this is a, a parable, but it's still he says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Now, he wasn't addressing Zacchaeus, but the point is, that's just how people, especially the religious high, saw people like Zacchaeus. But after meeting Jesus, Zacchaeus did an interesting thing here. He offered two things. One, half of his possessions. He didn't have to do that. But then on top of that, too, he offered to repay back everything he may have cheated anyone out of plus or times four. 
Now, we might be thinking here that there's some parallels here. If you ever read in Mark 10 about the rich young ruler, the one who Jesus said, you just drop everything and come follow me, and the man just hung his head low, walked away, that which prompted Jesus to say how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And we can see when Zacchaeus gives his stuff, Jesus says, salvation has come to you in your home. So we can easily make this a Bible story, again, for my Bible utility belt, Bible man and all those things, right? That this whole message is about self-realization, right? We can say, money is the root of all evil. Money prevents you from entering the kingdom of God. Money, you give freely, and salvation comes to you. So then here's the offering basket, right? Like, we can do all those things and make it so easy to make it a moral lesson. But a closer study of Zacchaeus's mindset actually starts to think that it's big more than him just trying to impress shoddy, right? We'll see in Numbers 5, a passage that uh, all Jews should know from verse 6, uh, you know, it's written in the Torah, any man or woman who wrongs another in any way and so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty and must confess the sin they have committed. They must make full or if you're taking those, write this word, restitution for the wrong they have done. Add a fifth of the value to it and give to all the people they have wronged. Now, this principle is called restitution, or we define it as the rightful restoration of something wrongfully taken back to its rightful owner. This is biblical, right? And so here's the, here's the math. Had he cheated, say, people out of like a 1,000 denarii, which is the currency of the times, uh, then if you're doing the math here, he would have to pay all that back plus an extra fifth, so he owes 200. It's kind of like if you lo lend someone money, you're just kind of getting your return on interest there, right? Now, the interesting thing here is if it's written in the law, here's the deal. If you do what the law says, even if you, were, if you did someone wrong, you repay it back, then you're cleared. And everyone around that begrudgingly knew that about him. And so it's interesting that when, uh, when uh, Zacchaeus offers to pay everything back times four, if you're doing your math, if you're paying a fifth of it back, multiply that by four, that means that's about four fifths on top of what he had owed. That means he'd had to pay about double, or he offered double what he initially owed. Now, you might be thinking that this is like a scratch my back, scratch your back kind of thing. If I did something wrong, then I give you an apology and we're all good, right? He might be thinking, like, you know, he, like, it's kind of like that guy who's, who never serves at church and then shawty passes by, so he's like carrying like 15 stacks of chairs so that he could impress everybody. We see that. We can see how easy it is for him to say that. But if you understand the biblical principle of restitution, Zacchaeus is not trying to impress or to appease. What he's doing here is recognizing that he's giving back to everybody what he wrongfully took because they're the rightful owner. Why? Because he was, uh, he was given back to the rightful owner of his life even though he was wrongfully using his own and he understood that he belonged to the Father. Amen? And in doing that, he realized none of this stuff is mine. None of this possession is mine. Nothing of this earth, if this earth is mine. Because I'm God's. Through Christ alone, I've been saved. And so he understood here that, you know, Jesus, when he called him by name, when he brought, called him down from the tree, when he dined with him, even though he was a sinner, a lowest on the totem pole society, he recognized, I'm seen and accepted by God. I'm recognized and called by name by God. To whom, do, to whom do I owe anything else? Amen. And so that's why Zacchaeus did what he did. So again, the second misinterpretation here, it's not about money. And, he, and here's my last in misinterpretation for us with this passage. And maybe you could translate this to others as well. This passage isn't about you. We always want to feel like we're the Zacchaeus in this story. Man, he's short and I'm ugly. He's short and I'm weird. He's short and I got no money. So we always want to feel like I understand the plight of Zacchaeus. And we're like, man, <laughs> we're like, you could always imagine yourself like you're on Shel Silverstein's like, giving tree and imagine that you're Zacchaeus. Except, perhaps we're not. Because if you read in verse 7 here, it says, he has gone, Jesus has, gone to be the guest of a sinner. 
For all the times that we think we're the main character, because we, I know we, we love being that, can we honestly say that we're oftentimes more like the ones barring other people, gatekeepers of the kingdom of God, than Zacchaeus himself? What we do oftentimes, if you're in a church today, you might have done this subconsciously, we recreate uh, s- uh, religious systems to undergird our preferred values, whether it's political, cultural, moral. And what we do is we mix that with scripture, kind of make a nice cocktail out of it. We indoctrinate followers to do it, and then we create a replicable, break-the-glass Christianity out of it. That's what we do. And what happens is this then negatively impacts the way we read scripture. In a book called Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes, uh, the author Randolph Richards said, before we can be confident we are reading the Bible accurately, we need to understand what assumptions and values we project onto the Bible. And so what happens is when we undergird our values with scripture instead of our scripture being our value itself, We create right-side-up ideologies for upside-down realities. That's just what happens. And this line of thinking makes us so in desperate need to be right-side-up at all times and condemning those who are a little upside-down. When real disciples of Christ were called like the Father, like the Savior, like the Spirit of God to go and seek and save the lost, go to the most marginalized, the most upside-down, and to find them and to disciple them. Because what's happening is like that, paint, that picture I gave before, the New York City picture. God initially had a plan for us when he made us in his image. He wanted to put us on an, uh, on an easel, display us at a gallery, and show how beautiful his work is, how beautiful his artistry is, how beautiful he is. For all to adore him, for all to glorify the artist through his work. But then what happens is in our delusion, we get tucked away instead and we think that these four walls, or honestly the 15,000 walls that this church has, I don't know. We like to tuck away and be like that Pharisee in Luke 18. At least I'm not like those guys. At least I'm not like them. You know, I might have my problems, but I'm not like them. I'm not the holiest man, but I know, I know my boy, he's, he's got real problems, not me. And so what happens is that religion has made that crowd spiteful. And similarly, churches have fostered spiteful people, uh, who are, uh, spite uh, for people rather, who are upside down. And we call them sinners, the broken, the lost. This is where we forget that while we're on this side of heaven, we're all sinful. We all live upside down from God's design. We all are stuck in this way. New uh, Testament uh, scholar Diane Chen once wrote, For every Zacchaeus who is found, there are many scribes and Pharisees who do not even acknowledge their lostness. A little ahead it says, It takes both gracious divine initiative and humble human response for reconciliation to occur. If you believe you're not lost because your bar of lostness is somebody else, then you're the most blind of anybody, church. That's just how it goes. If you think you're fine when you're actually blind, then you think you're right side up when you're actually upside down, then you will both lack the humility, but also what Diane Chen says, the ability to experience and receive reconciliation. That's a scary thing. Because the spirit-anointed Messiah brought salvation to all of Israel in Luke 19 and Luke 18 and Luke all of it. He brought the the promise of salvation to everybody, but the, the Jews were the first to reject him. But who received him? The poor, the leper, the tax collector, the Gentiles, they gladly received him. And so while Zacchaeus once could not see, but in humility received because now he knew he was made right with Christ through a personal encounter with him, those who thought they always could see the truth, those who assumed they were right side up, they live forever blind. They're the ones that God would say, I never even knew you. And that's the paradigm shift of Jesus, right? Uh, In Matthew 18, verse 17, in a famous passage on reconciliation, funny enough, uh, he wrote, uh, he says, rather, if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them, tax collectors, as you, or uh, treat them in in that scenario as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, that might first seem like an indictment against tax collectors, and it kind of is. But understand that he's making tax collectors and pagans, non-believers, equal. 
And you might be thinking then they're the most condemnable. But again, what's the point of the Gospel of Luke? That Jesus came to save and seek the lost, right? To, that he was always clear in this intention. Luke, uh, Luke 5 says, famous passage, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The beauty of the Zacchaeus passage, passage, therefore, is not all these things we've learned. It's not all these things that we can relate to. It's actually, in a meta-narrative, a, a series of reversals here, right? This whole passage, this whole gospel here is to say that the upside-down kingdom of God reverses human constructs of rightness. This very passage debunks religion. And I, so I want to break down a couple of reversals that we see, starting with this first one here that starts from Genesis 3, the fall. The world turned upside down in this very moment when Adam and Eve decided to eat of the fruit of the tree they shouldn't have eaten from, but they did anyway. And so we, when we experience the fall in Genesis 3, verse 9, the Lord God is saying, where are you? I don't know about you, but I love Genesis because when I read questions like that, I see my daughter here. Sometimes I'm playing peekaboo. I'm like, where are you? Oh, you're definitely not behind, behind the couch right now. Like, we, you know, God's not exactly playing peekaboo with us in that moment. But it's not like he's playing, he's not like he's, like he's missing the point either. He knows where we are. But that symbolic language of the fact that there's separation between me and him now. He's, he, there was a gap between him and his creation at that moment when he said that. Fast forward to today's reading, though. When Where does the Lord meet Zacchaeus? Anybody? On a tree. And I don't think that's an accident there. Uh, if we actually do a quick word study here, the name Zacchaeus itself, it's a Hebrew name, by the way. I know it's in the New Testament. It means the righteous one. Or it could always mean pure. Now, the man that we're t we see in the beginning of today's passage is neither of those two things, and I get it. But there's a beautiful symbolism that they meet on the sycamore tree, which in Hebrew is also zakim. The, so I'm not here to say that the tree gives him life like he's some, some Japanese MMORPG kind of game. No, 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 no. But the point is that there's a beautiful symbolism because it was at that meeting spot where repentance came. It was at that meeting spot where righteousness was given. It was in that meeting spot where, where Zacchaeus was not called by name because he was a, he was a good man. No. Jesus in his goodness was calling him Zacchaeus because he was uttering his prophetic destiny upon that man and that tree that he was calling upon. Zacchaeus, you, righteous one, come down immediately. And from that, he reversed the curse already of the tree of, of, of good and evil where he took a fruit that Adam uh, bit into a fruit he shouldn't have. It was in this tree where a new fruit was born, the fruit of the spirit of God. Amen. And we're seeing that exhibit all around. Because in the second reversal, something that we already talked about here, filled with the Spirit, now he understands Zacchaeus did restitution. He wanted to restore unto others what he wrongfully took from them because he was restored what he was wrongfully stripped from in a relationship with God. Because Zacchaeus said, no more of this nonsense, no more of this money, no more of this position, no more of this angst, no more of this hate. I want to live in the upside-down kingdom of God, a kingdom where the Beatitudes are preached, a kingdom where the poor is, are exalted, the rich are not, the where the weak and the humble and the, and, the, and the last are exalted. The last shall be first. Jesus himself came to this upside-down kingdom where he came not to be served but to serve. And so where Zacchaeus now had a position he decided instead to be in this upside-down kingdom with the Father. Lastly, the last reversal is this. And it starts as simply as when Jesus says this phrase, Zacchaeus, come down. What happens a lot is that pre preachers love this passage, like I said before. They love to, exo they love to uh, exude and they love to praise effort, right? Who cares if the case is a little short? Who cares if he's a sinner? He climbed that tree because he just wanted to meet Jesus. And to an extent, that's our case too. We should put more effort into it. If you know, you know. But 
it's clear that Jesus is saying in coming down, your effort won't earn you a place in the kingdom of God. In fact, he's saying, come down, Zacchaeus. Come down from that spot on the tree. Come down from where you are because I want to take your place. If you realize on the, in the beginning, it says that he happened to Jesus in the beginning of Luke 19. It says he was passing by Jericho. Normally you pass by something because you're on route to something else. And he sees that he's on route to Jerusalem. Because we see later in Luke 19, we see the image of Jesus riding on the back of a colt, entering the gates of Jerusalem, wa- in, met by a flood of palm leaves waving in the air. Because we understand that we can sa- shout Hosanna, that the reality is that the Savior has come. There will be deliverance for this kingdom. And we know, we know the end of the story. We just celebrated Good Friday just a couple of weeks ago. We know that the story goes that Jesus came to Jerusalem to die. He came to take his place on a cross to die because he understood that the greatest reversal was Zacchaeus. Come down from that tree of repentance. I will take your spot on the tree of life that is the cross. Amen. Amen. Right? And we're understanding here then that that is the very core of why we do what we do. Because when we recognize at the be- end of the story, when Jesus hangs from a cross, when they purportedly hung for six hours, who do you think he thought of? Maybe recency bias is a real thing. But maybe it was we little Zacchaeus. And even though we, weren't, we were just a thought at that moment, he thought of us as well. Jesus came to an upside down world to bring us back to right standing with the Father, friends. But in our reasoning, we've resigned to upside down thinking because we are worried about, worried about the ramifications of turning it right side up. Similar to how the picture's adhesives were deteriorating and all like the tapes were hanging by a thread. We, some of us are so worried how a life in Christ, being right with Christ, right, right with the Father, might make things bad for us. We might be worried about how relationships might deteriorate after we are in good, good, good standing with the Father. I'll be honest with you. Back in my college days when I came to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, the, the, from the first year on, I lost like 90% of my friends. 85% of that by my own doing. But that's a separate conversation for a different time. But also, we might be worried that how a life in Christ makes us surrender our plans. It feels like our future plans are hanging on a thread, hanging by a thread, and we worry about how writing that image, writing our lives, will still cause damage to the bigger picture. And you know what? The preacher that guaranteed a better life when you're in Jesus, they're a liar. <laughs> and we can't pretend like we know where God is going to take us. If you understand that, then, you're, then you don't know. But what I do know is what scripture tells me, and as I invite the worship team back up at this time, I do know this one thing, is that when he looks at you, what scripture has said multiple times is when he looks at you, his artwork, his piece, his masterpiece, the one that he's very well pleased with, the one that he's called very good, he says what scripture says most, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I believe that we, he made us in a certain way that is simply humble obedience and willful submission to follow God's will and go the full way where we don't fear the ramifications of where he takes us. We don't fear the cost of carrying our cross. We don't fear the cost of discipleship, friends. Because I understand here that the plans for me are great even though if I don't, they're not going to be better for me, and I get that. But I really believe, church, that he wants you to take his invitation today. As he said to Zacchaeus, come down. Come down immediately. And church, if Psalm 139 says that he knew you, he always knew you in the very womb, then I have very much reason to believe that he knows your name. And he knows that he's calling it and you into your prophetic destiny. I really believe that a lot of us here at this time, 
like Zacchaeus, come into the story struggling, wondering if we deserve it, content seeing Jesus pass by from a distance. But fill in the blank with me, church. And if I could start at this time, invite us to close our eyes where we are. He's calling you, church. He's calling you, son, daughter. And fill in that blank. He's calling you by your name. And he's ushering you into your prophetic destiny calling you into the plans that he had for you, wanting to re- re- for you to recognize that he has come to seek and to save the lost. And you're a part of that. But church, as the passage says in Luke 5, only the, ho- there's, the church is a hospital for the broken and the sick, not for those who are well. And we don't recognize that we're, we're, not ups, we're upside down and we keep believing that we're right side up. Then we'll never be made right with God. And so can I invite us to stand at this time? We're still closed in this place. But can I invite us as we stand to take a posture? Sometimes we do this thing where we raise our hands because of worship and all that's great. But can I invite us to, in this moment, be more like a child? almost asking to be picked up, almost waiting to be called, wanting to be called by name, wanting to be called into where we're called to be, wanting the security of knowing where we're called to. And in this posture, you can say, here I am, God. I don't come well, and I don't come well made. But I come humbly, Lord, knowing that I'm in need of a Savior. So come call me, God. Call me by name. And so in this space and in this posture, church, can we worship our Father at this time?